like to thank uh, Martha and Roy uh, for inviting me to uh, uh, talk here today. I'll try to keep this very brief. I'm uh, acutely aware that I'm what stands between uh, you and your treating your coffee addiction, as I'm kind of going through a withdrawal right now, so I'll try to move this along. Uh, so, brief, a uh, few words about myself. Uh, I'm a cognitive neuroscientist. I'm a professor in the Department of Psychology uh, in the Neurosciences Program, and I also co-direct Stanford's new uh, Center for uh, uh, Cognitive and Neurobiological Imaging, where we're trying to uh, enable the adoption of brain imaging technology to address pressing societal problems uh, across, across disciplines, uh, from humanities and science, uh, sciences to education, uh, law, uh, economics, business school, et cetera. Um, in my lab, uh, our, our central work is focused on trying to understand uh, the cognitive neuroscience, the psychological and neural mechanisms that enable uh, learning and, and remembering. Uh, in some of our work, we've uh, tried to integrate uh, new digital media supported by MediaX, uh, trying to understand how we might be able to optimize learning through social feedback in an immersive world, uh, uh, in that particular case, uh, in a second life environment. Uh, in other work in my lab, we're very much interested in how learning and, and remembering is modulated or affected by uh, our current goals, uh, uh, agendas, uh, and this sort of bring us, uh, brings us into thinking about interactions between memory and attention. More broadly, uh, we of course are interested in the neurobiology of memory and disease, but uh, perhaps of most interest for uh, this room, uh, the, the university has very much an outward-looking sort of uh, 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 agenda and orientation, and that's also the, the case for many of us uh, who work on uh, neuroscience here. Uh, as part of the CNI, we've kind of dubbed this, uh, 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 coined this sort of phrase, neuroscience for society, where we're trying to exploit uh, neurobiological data to weigh in on very important problems. In my own lab, we're very much interested in the, intera uh, the uh, interaction between technology and neurocognitive function, as well as uh, issues surrounding uh, the law and neuroscience. What I want to do in my very few minutes here uh, is to kind of weigh in on and illustrate for you, uh, just through a couple of examples, the ways in which first brain imaging technology and now brain imaging technology being wedded with other technologies from uh, machine learning uh, uh, analysis techniques and advances in uh, media that many in this room uh, have contributed to, how we're able to use uh, uh, this sort of interaction of technologies to address uh, what I think are important questions about uh, mind, uh, uh, and uh, the status of the mind in the real world. So Claude Steele, at the beginning today, uh, very briefly, uh, very nicely introduced uh, the, the way in which uh, functional brain imaging has transformed psychological science. It's just completely flipped the field. I came here as a graduate student in 1992. The very first fMRI, Functional Magnetic Resonance Imaging Study, was published in 1991. When I came here, fMRI really didn't exist, but with colleagues in the Lucas Center here in the med school, uh, we did the first uh, fMRI studies of memory uh, in 93, 94, uh, and if you look at the literature, it's just sort of been an exponential uh, a, a, a growth in terms of the role of brain data in informing questions about uh, psychological function and state. Uh, we're now in, and this is what I want to uh, briefly allude to, we're now in kind of the second phase of the field. In the first phase of the field, the work was kind of uh, trying to ask questions about where in the brain uh, are particular, uh, where in the brain are there changes in neural activity related to particular psychological states, such as having a memory versus not having a memory. And the analyses were rather simpl simplistic. Uh, we collect whole brain data, but the analyses uh, were uh, to take uh, patterns of activation, uh, sorry, to take, uh, right, measured uh, patterns of activation for particular conditions, such as looking at faces or looking at a complex scene or hearing sounds. and looking where in the brain there was a change in the amplitude of the uh, uh, signal recorded across the different conditions. So you'd subtract two different conditions and you'd say, oh, there in the frontal lobe you get more activation during events that are gonna be remembered versus events that are gonna be forgotten. You can do a lot with that and for the first decade of the field, this really uh, 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 helped us address a number of questions uh, that we couldn't address before, but it's limited. In the next uh, phase, and this is phase that we've now just entered, the wedding of this complex data that we're collecting, 40,000 points uh, recorded every two seconds in the brain. As the brain is uh, uh, thinking, perceiving, making decisions, uh, remembering, et cetera, we've uh, been able to exploit machine learning algorithms to not analyze the signal at individual places in the brain, but look at the pattern of activation throughout the brain. 
and, and try to classify or understand how these distributed patterns of neural responses relate to things that we care about as psychologists, economists, uh, legal uh, theorists, and, uh, and actors, et cetera. And so you can think of this, instead of looking at each point in the brain and asking how does activation change across my conditions, you can say, well, look at this pattern of activation associated with particular conditions, such as looking at a face versus looking at a scene. And can I, through machine learning analyses, can I figure out what differentiates the pattern associated with, say, looking at faces versus looking at scenes? Okay? Uh, and one can do this remarkably well in terms of uh, decoding what a person is uh, looking at, you train a classifier off of a set of training patterns, and then you feed in left out test patterns. And for things like um, decoding what the person is actually looking at in our own uh, work uh, in my lab, we could be 90, 95% accurate in knowing whether or not uh, somebody is looking at a face versus looking at a scene by just looking at their pattern of brain activity. Okay, that's, that's great, and it helps us advance, or we can sort of ask a number of interesting questions as visual cognitive neuroscientists. I wear my memory geek hat, and so I'm very much interested in questions of memory. Uh, and so what kinds of things can one do? Uh, in work that we're doing as part of the MacArthur uh, Network on Law and Neuroscience, we're interested in assessing the forensic utility of this approach. Can you f uh, uh, decode from distributed patterns of uh, neural activity the, uh, whether or not a person has previously seen a face or not. This is a, a question that's of significance uh, for the law. Eyewitness testimony is a fundamental question. Turns out, under certain conditions, we can be near perfect in, in the 90, 95% accuracy range in knowing whether or not, by looking at your pattern of activation for a single individual trial, we can be uh, near perfect in knowing whether or not you previously saw that face has some uh, potential forensics implications. It also has marketing, implication, uh, marketing implications. Can you use this to assess whether or not your ads have effectively been ta uh, taken up, et cetera? Is there knowledge that your ads stuck and left a residue in the brain? Last few minutes, let me just kind of illustrate. We can go beyond just sort of knowing whether or not somebody, say, has previously encountered something before, uh, but we can also begin to ask questions about, can we decode the content of, the, of their mental state? the contents of their memories, the information that they're bringing back to mind. And so this is gonna, uh, to make this point, uh, I'm gonna sort of uh, go through a little cartoon of how we think at a systems level, events such as this moment right now for your brain, where you've got this multi-sensory input, auditory, visual, you've got representation of space, you've got the semantics, et cetera. All these features of the event are being, uh, of this event are being represented in cortical and subcortical structures. This information projects ultimately onto a structure in the inner wall of your temporal lobe, what's called the hippocampus. This is the, the circuit that's affected first typically in Alzheimer's disease, which is why memory is typ typically uh, the first presenting uh, uh, complaint of patients uh, suffering from that disorder. This information converges on the hippocampus. The hippocampus essentially binds this information. And this hippocampal pointer, which is the binding uh, of uh, uh, across multiple neurons uh, in the hippocampus, that's the critical part of our memories. If you lack that, you won't be able to reinstate that past event when being given a partial cue. So when we think of um, uh, acts of remembering, if somebody asks you what happened uh, uh, this morning at MediaX, you're getting a cue that's allowing you to pattern complete out, bring back to mind, reinstate the features that were previously present and represented in your cortex or in your brain uh, the last time you encountered that cue, okay? And so we think of uh, retrieval partly as this sort of tra transporting the pattern of activation in the brain uh, back to a state, to a, a pattern that was present uh, in a prior moment in time, okay? And so now with these classifiers, you can actually begin to decode, and I'm very close to the end, Martha, I know. We're, uh, we, can begin, we can ask the question, can we actually decode what kinds of information are being reinstated back uh, yeah, out to cortex at that moment of retrieval, at that moment of remembering. And so you take, uh, here's one study that we've done. People encounter, this is very simple, uh, visually presented words and scenes, complex scenes or visually pre presented words and faces. You take these sort of uh, patterns of brain activity during learning, you feed them into a classifier uh, to differentiate between these two different kinds of an events. And then you can, of course, test how well did you do, and you can differentiate these two kinds of experiences quite well, here 82% accuracy. But now you can ask the question, well, let me, if I hold the input constant, just a visually presented word, can I, what, what kind of information is reinstated 
using that stimulus as a retrieval cue. And by looking at the retrieval brain patterns, can I know whether or not the person is remembering having seen a, 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 a complex scene before or having seen a face before? And in fact, and let's just look at the blue bar, you can do this quite, uh, quite well, well above chance, but nowhere near ceiling. This kind of illustrates that basically by looking at people's patterns of activation at the time of retrieval, we can decode what kind of memory content they're bringing back to mind. Uh, and we also look at this uh, pattern, and we can also uh, know whether or not the person's memory, we can actually predict how well they're performing. Uh, we can make uh, assessments of, uh, of their memory performance. Okay, last point, and then I'm done. This is early days for this second wave of uh, integration of brain imaging techniques and use of brain imaging uh, technologies to inform uh, 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 psychological problems amongst others. Uh, but we think, again, the wedding of technology is critical. The experiment I just described to you, it's very simple, visually presented words with a, a visually presented scene or a face. But in the real world, it's a, it, we're, we're in complex environments. And can we harness the kinds of technologies that many in this room have sort of contributed to building, such as digital tech, uh, media technologies, to situate our uh, experiments in a more realistic uh, form. And so we're uh, now beginning to ask, well, can we actually put people in two different virtual worlds? Virtual world one, where they're in a, a very simple environment. This is uh, work done with uh, Jeremy in collaboration with Jerry ba uh, Jeremy Balinson. Put them in uh, virtual world one, uh, where they're exploring, trying to find rewards, uh, or in virtual world, world two, where they're exploring and trying to find rewards. And then later on, scan them while they're uh, mentally in one of these two virtual worlds and be able to read out uh, what spatial, what world, from their distributed neural pattern, being able to read out what uh, world they believe they're sort of uh, currently situated in. And it turns out, I'll, I'll skip through this, this will be the last slide, but we can do this rel uh, quite well. We can, by looking at their distributed patterns of activation, know whether or not they're currently occupying virtual world one or virtual world two. We're excited about this wedding of sort of uh, 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 digital media uh, technology and neuroscience uh, because we think it'll help us address a number of critical questions uh, uh, that we as psychological scientists and neuroscientists care about, but we also think it has sort of broad implications. Uh, so thank you very much.